Hey, what's going on? Today I want to talk to you about one of my favorite camera rigs. This is the Canon 6D Mark II. Uh, this camera is really great for vlogging. It has the uh, flippy screen so you can see what you're recording, recording yourself. The camera also has incredible autofocus. The lens that I use with the camera is the 16 to 35 2.8. This is an ultra wide lens. It goes into the low light pretty good. The main reason that I bought this camera was for this ultra wide lens are able to get those blurry backgrounds uh, in a vlogging scenario, which is pretty cool. I like that about it. I, in addition to that, I use the Rode Video Mic Pro. Uh, this is a really great microphone. It's a shotgun condenser mic, mostly records what's out front. For a tripod, I am using the Joby SLR Focus with Ball Head X. This is uh, the beefiest Joby I believe that you can get. Uh, it's made of the metal instead of plastic. Uh, it's a little heavier, but it's also um, it's also uh, can handle a lot more weight than some of the smaller Jobies. Totally recommend that if you're going with this type of heavier vlogging setup for sure. So yeah, that's what today's video is going to be about. We're going to be talking about how to vlog using this type of setup in manual mode so that you can get the best video footage. Okay, so the very first thing we're going to want to do is put this camera in manual. Manual is my favorite mode. You can shoot video in the other modes. However, there's just a lot to be desired. And of course, in manual mode, there are some things we can do to sort of automate things. Get that camera in manual and let's start shooting. Okay, so the very first thing that I want to cover is this switch right here. This is the switch that uh, takes you between shooting a photo and shooting a video. Uh, now, one of the cool things about the 60 Mark II is it will preserve these settings for each uh, like, for example, my shutter speed, aperture, and my ISO settings are independent on each of these switches. And that's actually really nice. For example, if you're out shooting a video and you need to take a quick photo, it'll keep those settings independent of each other. And it's really quite nice. Uh, the next thing I want to cover is the info button. Uh, so the info button sort of cycles between different views that you'll see here on the display. The very first view is sort of like a framing display. It kind of gets everything out of the way so that you can see what you're framing. Uh, very useful to have. The very first one just kind of shows you some basic information like your shutter speed, aperture, uh, your ISO. And third one adds some information about uh, your focus, uh, what frame rate you're running at, your white balance. And, and then, of course, if you push it one more time, you get this histogram. So for those of you that don't know, a histogram is actually shows where your light is. And when you're shooting in manual, this is probably one of the uh, more important things to have. It will only be here uh, prior to hitting record. Uh, record is, of course, here on the start stop button. And of course, if you start uh, recording, you'll notice that, like I said, it goes away. But then you'll also be able to switch your info uh, in more of a limited view. That's important to note. Uh, getting your settings in check, you, you can use this histogram right here. Uh, one of the most important things when shooting in manual is having sort of a basic understanding of the exposure triangle. So uh, what the exposure triangle is, is it's basically your shutter speed, uh, which is how fast you're shooting pictures. Uh, it's in, uh, like, for example, this is 1 50th of a second. Your aperture, this is how wide open your lens is, how much light your lens is letting into the camera. And this, uh, for the smaller number here, is the wider open your lens is. Uh, then you have the sensitivity of the sensor of the camera itself. Now this is, uh, this is measured in ISO. And for right now, I have the camera set in ISO auto. So it's going to sort of figure that out for us. And if we sort of half depress the shutter up here, you'll see that it will actually tell us what it thinks the ISO should be. So then you can actually dial that in manually. So that's actually kind of a little hack uh, for figuring out your exposure. So let's just kind of play around with some of the settings here. Uh, for example, I'm going to show you that if I speed up my shutter, you'll notice that the image is getting darker. Uh, and I'm going to put it back where it was. Now, if you see right here, this is my aperture. If I close my aperture down, or it's, it's actually called stopping down your aperture, you'll see that I'm getting a darker scene. So if our scene had been too dark and say we were on four, we could of course lighten it up. Uh, same goes for the ISO. If I lower the ISO, you'll see that the scene is getting darker. If I increase the ISO, it will brighten up my scene. Now, of course, you can see here in the histogram that all my light is sort of peaking over here on the right side. 
And what that means is that, you know, my image is overexposed. I don't want my light to peek off on either side, either this side or this side. This is if the image had been underexposed. So, for example, let's go ahead and speed our shutter up some really high speed. Now you're going to see that all the light is over here peaking on this side. So we don't want that as well. So you might wonder, why is the exposure triangle important? Well, it's important because it allows you to get the most out of your shot. For example, if you are wide open, you're going to have the best low light. And you're also going to have the best depth of field, meaning that you're going to be able to get blurry backgrounds. So I do want to mention that this is a full frame camera. And one of the things that you're going to run into with this type of lens when you go outdoors on a bright sunny day or even a day where there's a lot of snow on the ground and it's super bright outside, you're not going to be able to keep your aperture wide open and, and do cinematography. It's just not going to work because there's going to be too much light and, and the camera is good in the dark. So what you're going to need to invest in is a, uh, is a variable ND filter. So what this variable ND filter does, and I will have links in the description uh, on what I believe is the best one because I've actually bought three of these and I finally found the one that I like. This is the, the K&H ND2 to 32. Uh, and as you'll notice, uh, this is basically ND2. This is letting half the amount of light in. And then if you turn this, if you spin it, it will darken up to 1 32nd the amount of light in. So this is what's going to solve the issue of it being too bright outside. Definitely want to pick up one, one of these, especially if you're using this 16 to 35 uh, 2.8. The next thing I want to go over with you is this Q button. So we could go into the menu and we could dig through uh, just a ton of settings in here. Uh, that It's actually going to be beyond the scope of this, this video, but there's a lot in the menu and it takes time to go in and out of the menu. So this Q button, which is also on screen right here, you can either hit it here or there's a software button. It allows you to control a whole bunch of things quickly on your camera. For example, the focus mode. Uh, here I have the uh, the AF method set to uh, autofocus with face detection. So this, this mode will actually track a face. It'll try to f find a face in your scene. Uh, you can also just tap on an area and then it will remember that area. So like if I move my camera around, you see it's actually tr tracking that middle French roast coffee bag without any problem at all. And that's really one of the cool things about Canon's dual pixel AF. It, it is really like having a second cameraman. It's pretty amazing. So the other uh, focus mode that I use, there's this one here, which I don't use, but there is the uh, single point autofocus. Now this particular focus, uh, it has this really neat like leveling meter and you can see that the camera will tell you if your shots uh, level or not. So that could be important. Uh, and then it has this box sort of in the middle, which allows you to say, I want always this area of the screen to be in focus. Uh, this can be rather useful if you're shooting like uh, B-roll slow motion uh, and you just want that point to always be in focus. And that's when I tend to use it. I tend to use face tracking during my A-roll stuff and then I tend to use this focus mode during B-roll. But not always, but sometimes. That's the focus mode. I'm going to go ahead and switch us back to the face tracking mode with point selection. If your camera is unable to find focus on something, a lot of times it will just focus an average of the scene in this method. I've seen that before, and that tends to work. Like if you're kind of doing a landscape or something, uh, generally speaking, that will be okay. If you want to get more in focus in your shot, you know, obviously you're going to want to lower your, and then you're going to end up getting more of stuff in your shot. But of course, then you're either going to have to put this back to auto, figure out your ISO, it's 1250. Uh, we go up to 1250 and we lock that in right there. So, uh, that's another thing I kind of want to just briefly touch on, uh, you know, this setting these fixed rather than auto will keep your scene exposed. And it really depends on what you're shooting. Like if you're coming from like a darkly lit room and you're going into some very bright environment, you might want to go with the auto just so that your camera will take care of that for you. Like a running gun situation where you're just vlogging. Auto is generally going to be okay in that situation. There are times where uh, you just don't want your light moving around. You want it to stay consistent. Like in this room, tend to dial this in and leave it there. Because that way, things just don't move around on you. And it's it just ends up looking better in your post-production. So the next thing I want to go over with you on the Q button is the frame rate. 
So this camera does not record in all I, like for example, the ADD, it only records in IPB. And generally speaking, there are two frame rates that I use. The first one being uh, 20, uh, 3.98 frames per second. This is like cinematography. This is what they use in the movies. It does also have 30 frames per second. This is like TV. TV a lot of times is in 30 frames per second. It's a little bit smoother. And then of course there's 60 frames per second. There's different reasons why you might use these different frame rates. Uh, one reason might be say if you're always shooting in 20 frames per second, you can then record in 60. And then when you're recording in 60, you can slow this down in your post-production to achieve slow motion. Some people I've seen just record in 60 all the time just for the sole purpose of they want their footage to look smooth. Like say you're a gaming channel, your gaming footage is always 60 frames per second, so why not record yourself in 60 frames per second? There are different philosophies behind that. I like to go with a 24 frames per second and then I use 60 for my slow motion stuff. It's just the type of things I do, vlogs and whatnot. Uh, I like the 24 frames per second look. Uh, and it also depends on your country too. Like if you're in a PAL country, uh, like from Europe or something, you're going to have different frame rates. You're going to have like 25 and 50 on this camera. Uh, I am, this tutorial that I'm doing is completely in NTSC uh, format. Whenever you select your frame rate, we're going to go back to 23 frames per second. If you want to have good motion blur, you always need to have your shutter running at half the length of the frame. Now that sounds kind of confusing. Just a basic rule of thumb. If you're shooting at 24p, have your shutter at 1 50th. This gives you the best motion blur. And what I mean by motion blur is like whenever you pan from left to right, there will it will look the best. Okay, so what would it be for 60 frames per second, you might ask? Well, in that case, 60 would be 120, but you'll notice that there's only 100th or 125th of a second. So in that case, we would probably want to select 125th of a second. And of course, the scene's dimly lit now. So I'm going to double this up to 320. And now you'll see that my light is sort of falling into place. So that's the other thing to think about when you're shooting at a faster frame rate. You're going to need to have a higher ISO or you're going to need to open up your aperture more. It's really just figuring out that exposure triangle and where it needs to go. So the next thing on the Q menu is this. This is the digital IS. Now the lens that I have does not have IS built into it. This camera does have digital IS. This isn't IBIS or any type of sensor stabilization. This is just digital IS. So if you notice, um, there are three settings. I currently have it turned off. This allows you to get the widest shot possible. If you select the second option this is for just general like carrying the camera around it will it will digitally stabilize your shot if you're running or something you're going to want to use the third one you'll notice it crops in even more again like i said this kind of just stabilizes your shots a little bit uh, in your pre-production uh, i will say does not work bad for digital is um but generally if i'm on a tripod i will turn it off if i'm walking around vlogging i tend to use the middle setting the next setting that I want to go over with you is the microphone audio level setting. On my microphone, of course, it has uh, three settings. It has off, on, and then it also has a high pass filter. This high pass filter will remove a lot of the really deep low end bass that you might experience when bumping the camera. I tend to leave this turned on all the time. It doesn't really seem to affect much like with people's voices and stuff. Uh, so I just tend to leave it turned on. That is up to you. Then there's actually three settings below that. There's negative 10 dB, 0 dB, and plus 20 dB. Now, I tend to mostly leave this on the plus 20. And then if I get in a really noisy situation and I notice that my microphone is peaking, I will put this on 0. So with the mic on plus 20, you'll see that there's this little volume control here. And you notice if I turn this up, it starts to peak out in the red. Generally, what I do is turn it all the way down and then I turn it up one or two. Now again, this is this is my mic doing all of the audio gain and then I really need very little gain in my camera itself. The next setting that I wanna go over with you is the auto white balance. Auto white balance actually tends to work pretty good, especially if you're starting in, but if you get into some weird lighting, you can pick uh, well, the course between auto white balance and auto white balance with white priority. You can also dial in your 
color temperature and tint, um, as well as you can select here between sunny, shaded days, cloudy days, tungsten lighting, fluorescent, flash photography, uh, customizing it, or you can dial your Kelvin in uh, to a specific color temperature. Okay, so the next thing that I want to go over with you is the picture style. There's a bunch of different styles that come built in. I tend to shoot in the neutral style. I tend, I like that this gives me more control uh, in my post production in Adobe Premiere. Um, there are is standard. There's portrait, landscape. There's all these different styles you can choose from. Within the neutral, I tend to dial some of my settings down. Uh, for one, the sharpness strength, I tend to dial all the way down to zero. I then add sharpening back in my post production. I found what works really well on this camera is to have your contrast all the way down. This will give you the greatest dynamic range in your post production. It's going to lift those shadows and drop the highlights so that you get the largest dynamic range from your camera. And of course, that will be great when you're editing. So that's it for the Q menu. Uh, as a little bonus material, one of the things that I just recently learned about, uh, if you dial your settings in for 24p again this is 24 frames per second 150th 2.8 and i'm going to set my iso to auto and i go into menu i can go over to the third tab which with the little wrench and number five and then hit custom shooting mode one of the cool things about this can actually register those settings to shooting mode c1 and say okay then i can go back all the way back to my live shooting mode. I can hit Q, I can select 60 frames per second, uh, bring this up to 125, 125th of a second. Again, putting my ISO to auto, then I can go into menu and hit custom shooting mode. I can register settings and put these on setting C2. So what this has done is it has put those settings on the C1 and C2 up here on the dial. So you can see here I'm in C1. I'm going to switch to C2. See my frame rate has changed from 60 to 125. And then of course I can switch back to 24 and 150th. Really useful, nice for switching between A roll and B roll type of stuff. And of course you can dial in your ISO each time if you need it. Otherwise you can just leave this in auto. All right guys, that's pretty much it. Don't forget, there's links down in the description. If you have any questions, feel free to leave me a comment. I will try to answer those as quickly as possible. I hope that this video has been helpful to you. I love shooting in manual. It just adds a lot more ability to what I'm doing. And it's, it's, just, it's, it's a lot of fun. So that's going to be it for this one. I guess I will see you guys in the next one.